मैं डॉक्टर निसार अहमद साहब से दरखास्त करूंगा कि यहाँ तशरीफ लाए डॉक्टर साहब का नाम संजीव हरकोट है वाबस्ता लोगों में किसी तारीफ का मौजूद है वेलकम डॉक्टर निसार साहब इट्स आर प्रोफाउंड ऑनर टू हैव यू हेयर टुडे एंड आई विल बी लर्निंग अ लॉट फ्रॉम यू इन दिमिस ऑफ यू एस पार्क रिलेशंस which have been always uh, in a situation of roller coaster hamare ha yahan bahut sari misgivings hain bahut sare wrong kism ke ideas hain conspiracy theories hain jinko correct karna bahut zaruri hai uske liye un logon ki zarurat hai ki jo is sari situation ko pak us relations ko bahut depth se samajhte hain और इसके अंदर जो कुछ सुनने में आता है बहुत सारी सिचुएशंस में वो सच या सही नहीं होता तो आज की इस नशस्त में हम डॉक्टर निसार साहब से दरख्वास्त करेंगे कि आप अपना व्यू हमें दें ताकि हमें समझ आए कि पाक यूएस रिलेशंस क्या हैं और इसके क्या हमारी जिम्मेदारियां हैं हमारे इसके का क्या कैवियट्स हैं क्या हमें इसके अंदर जो एक्टिवेट करना है कम्युनिटी के अंदर जो समझने में आए ताकि हमारे ये रिलेशंस ठीक हो सके आ, इस आज की नशिस्त का फॉर्मेट ऐसे होगा कि डॉक्टर साहब पहले अपने व्यूज देंगे और उसके बाद हम एक क्यू एंड ए सेशन करेंगे क्यू एंड ए में हम लेफ्ट से राइट की तरफ जाएंगे और सब हाजरीन दोस्तों को मौका मिलेगा कि वो अपने जो भी सवाल हो डॉक्टर साहब से पूछ सके आ, मैं गुजारिश करूंगा कि सवाल को बिल्कुल मुख्तर रखिए अगर आप कोई कमेंट देना चाहें तो ज़रूर दें लेकिन कमेंट होना चाहिए स्पीच नहीं होनी चाहिए और उसके बाद फिर हम एक कंक्लूडिंग सेशन करेंगे जिसमें डॉक्टर साहब को रिक्वेस्ट करेंगे कि कोई कंक्लूजन दें ताकि हमें कम्यूनिटी को एक आगे का रास्ता नज़र आए कि हमें क्या करना चाहिए ओवर टू डॉक्टर निसार अहमद सर thank you very much uh, concept uh, and thanks to all the friends uh, raja saab and all this uh, these uh, familiar faces and some of them thank you ji uh, i really feel distinctively honored to be um, speaking to the group who are so keen and curious about us pakistan relations which are not simply important they are very critical and the relation between these two countries even would affect directly and indirectly to the pakistan diaspora who lives in this country and then when the decisions are made uh, about our children in this country and we don't have an access and we can't influence the decision making process so that will not be helpful to us instead we need to participate we need to in, uh, understand the system and then uh, work with the system so that uh, we have an access and influence in decision making when the decisions are being made about our own children i feel honored uh, that uh, today i have the opportunity to talk to you on us pakistan relations i'll try to be uh, relatively brief because it's a very vast subject and i profusely apologize that i'm already late uh, we were stuck at george washington bridge there was an accident as far as us pakistan relations are concerned us pakistan have a very long history of friendship which was full of highs and lows and then there had been many rough patches then and we are together in very often in tragedies whether it's in mogadishu or crimes whether it's against the uh, russian troops from afghanistan rain or shine war or peace what ultimately happened in spite of many rough areas our friendship 
ultimately survived. If you recollect, in 2011, uh, Raymond Davis case, Osama bin Laden case, then there was a Salala tragedy at the border of uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Virtually both these nations stopped speaking to each other. And, but certainly, even if those two countries are in a war, they still have an indirect communication. We still were connected, but not speaking to each other. And uh, what changed was uh, when Nawaz Shri visited uh, USA in 2013. In 2011, we were not talking to each other. In 2012, we were trying to talk to each other. In 2013, we actually started talking to each other. When Dawashi, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, visited Washington, that is where the resumption of working groups for strategic dialogue started. So again, we were in line as partners, as players, as allies, as friends, because we have many things that we share in, in, when it comes to that region, whether it's stability, it's prosperity, it's peace, it's consolidation of democracies and development. We share many goals together. And since then, those working groups uh, are very actively engaged, actively involved. I myself had arranged some round table for a few groups. And even when the Prime Minister of Pakistan visited Washington twice in 2013 and 15. I organized, uh, after they met the president, I organized round table for the briefing to the mainstream Americans, which was given by Sattar Jaziz. So I think uh, uh, we should understand that this relationship is not simple. It is uh, difficult and complex. In certain areas, we certainly converge. In certain areas, we have parallel interests. And in certain areas, we have conflict and divergence, which is not uncommon. This is this kind of relationship there with any two nations. There's no two nations who are completely interfaced or completely bonded with each other without having any difference from time to time or any irritants from time to time. So in international relations, there is no permanent friends or enemies. Uh, what is permanent are the interests of nations. That is what they keep uh, paramount. And as you know, USA and Pakistan, Pakistan is the second biggest recipient, biggest recipient of USAID after Israel. And 1.5 billion carry Luger and uh, uh, Burman Bill uh, for is being really invested in Pakistan every year and USA is uh, very helpful in legislative strengthening in that country in Pakistan then reforms everywhere whether it's police security area and particularly US is part of major chunk of this uh, aid is being invested in water area for education, for health, for infrastructure, uh, for better communication. And that is very helpful to Pakistan. And uh, the other thing USA had been always asking Pakistan to take action in North Waziristan. Uh, actually, uh, General Kiani was reluctant for some time because uh, knowing our own limitations, our own capacity, and uh, he was afraid that it might offend many of those even who live here, but they are our, on our side and our friends. Because there's always a collateral damage when there is a uh, war or a campaign with armed people between them. So it was approved uh, that time, and they almost started that operation. But uh, the tragedy in Nebatapad uh, really took its toll and General Raheel Sharif uh, virtually energized and galvanized and seriously 
uh, took a position where they accelerated the not only the pace of the operation but even force of the operation. Uh, right now we have about 180,000 uh, Pakistani troops in uh, Fata area in uh, northwest India, and uh, which is a lot for Pakistan because some of these troops were removed uh, from our eastern border. Uh, from our starch, uh, it's a very staunch rival in a way, India, to really take care of that uh, area of North Pakistan. Uh, as we are talking, 97% of uh, North Pakistan territory now is uh, under uh, Pakistan military's control. But I don't mean that by this, the, it's the end of the challenge. The real challenge will be followed which will be how to restore the lives of those people who are displaced, how to reconstruct their lives, and how to bring them back and provide them shelters, education, roads, health care system. That's a mega project. And sometimes I wonder how a country like Pakistan, who is already uh, dealing with so many challenges and dangers, not only within, but even from outside, because there are so many stakeholders involved in this. And th that 3% territory, that 3% territory, which is, thank you very much, you know, the mic is a squint. One is not 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 a squint. But at the same time, when it comes to U.S.-Pakistan relations, it is so critical that Pakistan not, cannot afford to have a conflict. What to talk of with Afghanistan or with India, uh, even with USA, and it should not be considered perceived that USA is thousands of miles away from Pakistan. USA should always be factored in as a neighbor of Pakistan. They are all around that territory. And at the same time, uh, the forces, the presence of their forces, and then common interests also that we have in protecting shipping lanes, in securing uh, natural resources, uh, security interests, logistics, geopolitical and strategic interests. We have many things in common. But foreign policy is crafting, uh, being very callous. It is the responsibility of the Americans to protect the American interests. And it is the responsibility of Pakistani leadership to protect the interests of Pakistan when they are engaged in dialogue. But the, the good part about it is, in spite of um, certain setbacks and in spite of uh, certain challenges, Pakistan and USA are engaged in constructive dialogues and uh, helpful dialogues. And both of these countries have started uh, dialogues in a way where both are trying to be more honest, more open, more frank, more candid. And uh, they have converged on many points now. It's not only war and terrorism. There are many other points. And uh, that is very helpful for Pakistan. And this continuity of this relationship it should stay there. And our friends, our community, our diaspora, living in this country, the most powerful country ever in the recorded history of mankind, with the mightiest military machine and highest end of living, you are reaping and enjoying the dividends from that country. And we should not only appreciate this, but we should get involved. Uh, we should not isolate ourselves. We should not try to recreate Pakistan here. Pakistan was created in 1947. And we can be very helpful if we can, people to people, with the mainstream Americans, we interact. And this relationship, this friendship, can be translated into friendship between both the nations. And you, all of you have a responsibility. Each one of you should exercise that responsibility. Believe me, it's a beautiful country. It gives you access. Provided you invest in the system, provided you become a part of the system 
and for people uh, like you and others who are fairly affluent, who are doing well in this country, they can play a great role as you have seen even in these elections, that uh, how much role different communities played, uh, even though the results were totally unexpected. So, at the same time, when the leadership comes from Pakistan, we should try to question, even though generally it's a monologue, uh, there's no question-answer session, there are no bilateral dialects, there are no meetings with the community across the country, if, even they also need to change their approach if they want to get more mileage from Pakistani American communities as to improve and enhance alignment, reinforcement, and relations between two great nations. After all, both our nations have so many things in common. To begin with, we got freedom from the same imperial forces, imperial powers that USA got freedom from. And those imperial, and with faith in God and determination. It, even their uh, national bird is an eagle, and Pakistan's national bird, and uh, the vigilance is attributed with the eagle, that was Elama Iqbal's uh, eagle. I mean, and no more that simple. In a bipolar world, relations were simple because there were two parties. Now the world is becoming multipolar. Now the relations are multipolar, and they become very complex. And then you are dealing with USA. USA has the most complex, most expen expanded and extensive system of governance in the world. No other country in the world has this kind of system. Only this country has the capacity to monitor every corner of the world, of the globe. No other country has this capacity. They, even though the world is going through transition from a unipolar world to a multipolar world, but still, American wants to still lead. But they do understand they can't lead alone now anymore. It's no more a unipolar world. So they're trying, working very hard to build alliances. They're working very hard to encompass more friends into their fold uh, everywhere. And particularly these days, in the South China Sea area, in the South Asia, in the Indian Ocean, and even in Australia, they are trying to bring all these countries in a fold where they still would like to have the mightiest military machine with a cutting edge technology. And even in a multipolar world, they would like to lead, of course, not alone. This time, they need uh, friendship and allies, alliances with many other countries. So, as you know, USA has a global partnership with India, strategic, and uh, then they have <coughs> Japan, they have the security pact with Japan, they have security pact with Singapore, Mal Malaysia, Philippines, and even Australia. And uh, there is a good reason for that, uh, you all understand. So, Pakistan is trying its best on one hand, to take care of the internal dangers as well as external dangers simultaneously, and Pakistan's plate is full. So that makes very critical for Pakistan, since they can't afford to engage in any conflict, that they work together with USA, which is the biggest trading partner of Pakistan uh, at this time. And Pakistan is asking and they are interested, and they are doing investments in energy sector, and they are working in education, health, and in many other sectors. And Pakistan, as you know, in spite of the fact that, uh, that you can have questions about the quality of governance in Pakistan, but they are still uh, working very hard a way how they can consolidate this democracy. They will prefer this democracy but when the people are elected, uh, just getting the majority doesn't mean the democracy has come and it will solve all the problems. Democracy is not a product, it's a process. Even in this country today, still they need to improve in democracy. 
And why they reached to this point so far is that they believed always that every system has its uh, uh, challenges, its demerits, and even democracy has some flaws. So they tried to resolve all these flaws of democracy by becoming more and more open, more and more democratic. In Pakistan, they want to overcome and resolve the flaws of democracy by becoming more autocratic, and that doesn't help. In an effort to protect democracy, they want to rule autocratically. They also need to review their approach uh, in Pakistan and uh, the leadership, uh, whoever is in power, doesn't matter. And if they really want to consolidate democracy, if they really want democracy, continuity they want it uh, enduring democracy, sustainable democracy, they will have the political uh, institutions and will have to take things seriously, work together, develop some honor code, ethics code, so, and then also must decide and converge uh, about the critical national security issues, that these issues will not be brought into the public debate. Others can be political, can be politics, but not the critical national security issues. So, Pakistan also needs to put her own house in order. That will make Pakistan less vulnerable and uh, should also, they will have to work very hard to really uh, picking uh, momentum and force for converging forces instead of divergent forces. Pakistan is a very diverse country. It's a multicolored country. It's a beautiful country. It's a huge population, sixth country in the world. Then at the same time, uh, the landscape, the topography, natural resources, human resources, and then look at the coastal line, how long it is, and its, it's uh, geopolitical location, then strategic importance. Uh, we need to capitalize on this. And you people can play a role. And if Pakistani diaspora are living only in this country, believe me, if they decide that and they demonstrate uh, determination that we want to improve image, reconstruct image, and change the face of Pakistan, even this diaspora only can do it. But the leadership in Pakistan has to help this diaspora to overcome their skepticism, the way the country is being governed. They have to restore their trust in the leadership, in the institutions. Because from time to time, we do think, I mean, uh, that um, thing of the past in South Asia, there are two parallel and uh, viable uh, parties, one in India, one is Pakistan. No, even Afghanistan can create serious challenges for Pakistan. Pakistan in, diverged with USA on this point, that uh, India's influence inside Afghanistan should not expand and should not be to a point where they can use their leverage and they can start a proxy war. Even now, uh, in two of their provinces, Konar and Helmand, I think, uh, there are people who come from that area and they cross the border and inside Pakistan area, they have killed many of our soldiers. Their intelligence has started working with uh, Taliban Pakistan. And Ashraf Ghani is a very educated man. Uh, and I tell you, he's, uh, <clears throat> he's a very good student of history, well read. Very superior education. He tried to take an initiative somehow by differing with all his support system that let me take an initiative to improve, restore, and reconcile relations with Pakistan. It's important for us. But his initiative uh, did not produce many results they expected because certain things he asked for, they committed it, and they could not deliver on all of them. And then the same support system told him, did not we tell you uh, it will not work? So now, in Afghanistan, many people think for the devastations or destruction of Pakistan, ISI has a role, even though ISI might have in old time contact with the Taliban, but they never controlled the Taliban. They were running that country on their own. But this is being perceived 
act in a different way. So Afghanistan, Pakistan has given um, Afghanistan an assistance of uh, $500 million before for social work, for security, for uh, health, education area, infrastructure area, and even the last uh, Brussels conference, which was held in October, I think, they pledged another $500 million for Afghanistan. In 2013, they built a university in Afghanistan and handed over the key to the governor of Balkh, and this was called Liaquat Ali Khan University. There had been 30,000 people who got superior education in Pakistan in the last 10 years and 20 years. And then in, in these two, three years, there were more than 3,000 scholarships given to Afghanis and uh, their education was virtually free and they have graduated from different uh, colleges and schools of Pakistan. Then Pakistan has also given additional $20 million to Afghan government. Five million uh, uh, was their cash and the other 15 million was to train uh, Afghanis and then also for equipment. So Pakistan is playing its part, playing its role. Lekin in that region, is very complex. There are so many um, stakeholders in that uh, region, and they are involved, they are engaged, they have their own interests, even Russia, even China, even Iran, Pakistan, India, and even some countries in the West, and Americans particularly. And Pakistan's concern is also that when Americans withdraw from Afghanistan in 2017, as they said, we'll walk away, uh, that walkway can uh, hurt even Pakistan. So Pakistan doesn't want that they should just abandon Afghanistan the way they abandoned Pakistan after winning the war against Soviets. So second, Pakistan uh, wants the USA should play the role uh, uh, to mediate a reconciliation between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Somehow that uh, trust deficit, I think it's a syndrome and it exists in all the countries in the region. In, in case of uh, Afghanistan, they are very skeptical about Pakistan. And certainly there's an influence of Indians also in this case. But uh, originally, they want to have better and stronger relations with India, stronger relations with other countries. But still, Pakistan is really convinced and still want it that we reconcile, we have a common history, we are uh, attached with each other by the strategic relations between USA and India. It is broadly based. And uh, Pakistan was denied those six F-16 even. And they are uh, not only transferring uh, military technology to India, but also they are transferring and giving them a license to manufacture F-16, which was denied to F-16 had a tremendous role in the war against terrorism, and they realized it. There's a VR and TR. There's a, you need to replace old vehicles they, because they keep doing it for themselves as well. And uh, they had the precision equipment, precise target, with minimum collateral damage. It was a huge success. And even Pakistan Army agrees that Air Force role has been uh, monumental uh, in this war in uh, North Waziristan. So Pakistan does need this kind of help, but USA has uh, uh, given them uh, uh, this uh, helicopters, uh, gunships, uh, combat helicopters, and they are giving them, they have signed a contact for uh, in the area of military assistance as well. And the, these are positive uh, signs. And both sides are trying to be more realistic, more pragmatic. On one hand, the USA has, is, has started understanding the limitations and sen sensitivities and the capacity of Pakistan. And USA also has started understanding the limitations of USA because right now USA is virtually mm, operating on a thin ice. There are so many areas where they are involved. 
so many areas. It's unbelievable, uh, and people are concerned what will happen next. Nobody's sure. Nobody can draw the future picture and what would happen after this, what would happen next 10 years, five years. Nobody can redraw that map. But the map of the world kept changing. It will keep changing, and it will keep uh, redrawing. No boundary, these are imaginary lines throughout. They are crafted by uh, individuals. Uh, they, they are all, in a way, unnatural. And when it comes to Pakistan, uh, one thing that we have missed is that uh, Jinnah uh, did carve out the frontiers of a state. Our struggle was different than the Indians. They were working to, just to get freedom from the imperial powers. And our struggle was very different. We were working so hard to give birth to a new nation. And Jinnah carved out the frontiers of a new state which never existed before. But we have not been successful uh, in transforming that state into a nation. And this is one of the reasons that we still have uh, many problems in different provinces, and the capacity of leadership, the competence of leadership, and these martial laws coming one after the other, and the democracy became recurrent, and even martial laws became recurrent. So there was not a sustainable democracy, and we are very fortunate that we have uh, this transfer of power peacefully from the last elected government, which happened, I think, for the first time, to the newly elected government. If this process continues, believe me, democracy has its uh, problem, but still it is the best available system to govern a country, to build a nation, to steer a nation to move forward, and you can see even in this country, they have covered such a long distance <coughs> since its inception. This country has the oldest democracy, and still they are having the problem with the democracy. And they continue to say, we need to um, bring reform, we need reform, we need reform in the electoral map, in the, um, in the democratic process, in the democracy, but they do adhere to democratic values. And that is what has helped this country. Washington, D.C., where I work with the mainstream Americans, I'm very proud that uh, I have uh, friends inside Washington who are inside the Beltway, and they help me in a very big way. I get education from them. I learn from them. Because we are all sitting together, there's no end to learning. When there's no end to learning, this means we are all students. We all need to learn more. And that, what, whatever I achieve and gain from them, learn from them, then I bring them together with the visiting Pakistani people who make the decision in Pakistan, whether they are from security, DOD, or the, whether they are political sector, uh, then I try to bring them together so that they can understand better and bring to a better understanding. Pakistanis should know and understand how Americans look at Pakistan, our Pakistani diaspora, through their lens, and how Pakistanis look at the American people and American government or administration through Pakistan's lens. When they will know this thing, then it will become easier against a background of better understanding to bring both the nations closer. It's a great challenge, but I personally think that, uh, as I said before, Kashmir. our friendship survived. Kashmir. Our friendship survived. And on Kashmir issue, this had become old enough, but uh, genuine dispute, genuine conflict, where India is a party, Pakistan is a party, and the most important party is the Kashmiris themselves. And uh, Pakistan is very well aware of this, that Pakistan has a role to play. They do give logistic, diplomatic uh, support. And at the same time, even Indian, even the Americans accept that this is a dispute. This is a disputed territory. But uh, in the world, if you take this case to the different capitals of the world, uh, Pakistani diplomatic court face a problem. 
nobody want to touch this issue uh, even with a 10 feet pole uh, because everybody's plate is full these days everybody is engaged in securing their own position in securing their own countries and how to move forward and uh, at the same time indian stand has hardened particularly after uh, modi's government and uh, i personally think that pakistani development accord and pakistan must continue to work in a way so that the issue remains alive the issue must be kept alive we should not get discouraged you know many times if, if the issue alive natural course of history help you to achieve that goal and natural course of history's currents are very powerful look at central asian states there was not even a movement of autonomy lekin it was natural course of history that all of them became independent without uh, even taking out single possession that is called natural course of history but we have to keep the issue alive and we should also understand that indians don't accept any mediation america's interest with india has expanded to a point that america won't like to offend india in any circumstances so when they are suggested to them that they should uh, create an atmosphere so they say this is a bilateral issue between pakistan and india we don't want, want any mediation any intervention and then in their own home they think that after shimla agreement Uh, this uh, security council resolution become redundant even though they don't but this is how they sell it they sell it in that shimla conference pakistan has agreed all issues all disputes including this in kashmir we will resolve peacefully on the negotiating table but at the same time they don't change their position at the same time they are not willing to engage so uh, realistically speaking ultimately <coughs> there has to be a resolution but most probably it could be it would be compromised pragmatic and dignified where every party comes out as a winner no party should think they are loser in this negotiations and uh, i have always suggested about kashmir that pakistan must really galvanize their diplomatic core to keep this issue wherever they go they must talk about it and so that in the capitals of the world they know that so many kashmiris uh, there was in another panel discussion at carnegie and somebody one of the speaker from uh, uh, hudson institute was there and he said pakistan inherited a very strong army so i told her <laughs> i told her that uh, what are you talking if pakistan had inherited a strong army then the kashmir dispute with them were resolved in 1947 it was not an issue even if pakistan had a strong army and inherited a strong army so in this case i think we should try to understand that uh, uh, this country will continue to lead uh, they they have their eyes on asia and we must maintain constructive dialogues work with them try to pick up common threads even though we have uh, many differences but uh, we can set aside the differences and still pick up common threads and try to expand that narrow band into multiple areas create interest and value to a point that we remain important in the geopolitical point of view and the strategic point of view and for that matter Uh, i think uh, in, in the beginning you mentioned would you think tanks also uh, this is uh, really a serious issue in pakistan they don't have uh, those uh, think tanks which the country needs the role of think tanks is uh, amazing and uh, one of the problem chinese are having they say america has so many think tanks and we don't have they are working very hard to have think tanks because this is the work of the think tanks with gather uh, data synthesize information and then develop scenarios for different uh, different kinds of scenarios for the future and to deal with different kind of scenarios they come up with plans plan a plan b 
how we will respond at that time if this picture develops, an improbable picture, <coughs> then they really help shape public opinion. Then in public policy, in security issues, in energy issues, in even now in even in healthcare issues, the think tanks in Washington D.C. are playing a great role, and I go to most of them who are directly or indirectly have interest uh, are a chair on South Asia, and this is. Uh, what you should do here also, you have to hear the Asia Foundation, I think, and uh, Carnegie also is here. And, and those people who are in media here, meet them, me interact with them, invite them, listen to them. It is important to listen to each other. That will be very helpful in the long term, uh, forging a relationship with each other. If we will only be critical of each other, then well we'll engage to construct a reconstructed relationship between uh, uh, both these. Now, Pakistan has to strike a very delicate balance in their relationship with Iran. Iran is just a next door neighbor. And at the same time, uh, their nationalism is very well and deeply anchored. Now, on the other hand, uh, in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, there's a deep division between Shiites and Sunnis. Uh, one side is being supported in that war or proxy war by Iranians, one side is uh, uh, supported by Saudis. Now Pakistan has a dilemma, Pakistan had great relations with Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, he has to balance it so delicately that without offending Saudi Arabia, Pakistan should still enjoy good relations with Iran. Iran is our next one. We can't do fundamentally, we can't afford to have a conflict with any country in the world what to take off those who are our neighbors. And with these words, I think I'll uh, close my remarks and uh, the question and answer session, one can ask any question, because otherwise this is a very long story on uh, the turbulent world. There is so much more to say. And the role of Pakistan, role of Iran, role of India, role of China, role of Russia, uh, role of Afghanistan, uh, if we want a safer, secure, stable, and a stronger Pakistan. It won't be easy, it's a great challenge, but we need to uh, demonstrate will and consistency. And really, uh, you see, it's so important for all of us to know that we can choose to live in any part of the world. If we are proud of our rich inheritance, we are very proud of our adopted land, its people, and the way it gives us constitutional protection. This is something very rare in the world. You don't get it neither in Pakistan, nor even Saudi Arabia. But this country gives you that constitutional protection. And there's a due process of law as well. And I think uh, with these remarks, I will uh, close my uh, discussion. Uh, I will say that uh, Pakistan, U.S. friendship, Zindabad, and Pakistan, Bahindabad. Thank you. Wonderful. Very good. Very good.